Hello, and welcome back to session two of the Community Foundation or Nextflow training. My name is Chris, and I'm a developer advocate at Secure, and I'll be the one taking you through uh, the rest of the material in this workshop. What we'll be doing today is really expanding upon what was covered as a part of session one. So we're going to go back and sort of relook at some of these concepts and ideas that you've been introduced to um, in a little bit more detail. I really encourage you to take your time as you're going through this material. Uh, this will be available on YouTube now and forever. Um, so you're very welcome to pause, come back, uh, relook at things um, at any time um, at your convenience. I will be doing a lot of demo style uh, sort of descriptions today while I'll sort of do the demonstrations with you um, or for you. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is go back and sort of try and break these. Um, go back and try and break them, fix them, put them back together, do something strange, see how far you can push the limits um, of NextFlow just to give you a really good understanding um, of how all of this fits together so that when you come back and try and do this to yourself um, with your own sort of data, with your own pipelines, um, you have a much better understanding of it also. For today, uh, what we'll be doing is opening up a new Gitpod environment. So this is back on the training.nextflow.io website. Um, there's this button here to open up um, Gitpod. And if you click on that again, this will take you through to a window that looks something like this, where you can, where you can continue to create a new um, virtual environment for today's um, sort of exercises. I have already created um, an environment like this. So just to speed things up, I already opened this up in my window. Um, it might take you just a couple of moments to load this uh, for yourself, especially if it's for the first time. If you didn't attend session one, um, just very quickly, Gitpod is a virtual environment that we use because um, you can open it up with all of the different data and tools and software that we're using already preloaded. To access this, all you need is a GitHub account, and there's just a little bit of registering um, and a little bit of uh, waiting for this container to load and pull for the first time. Where we will start today in terms of material is down here in channels. Um, largely what we'll be doing is sort of just working our way down this list. Of course, we've already looked at um, Groovy, um, but we'll otherwise follow this order down to um, Secure Platform, which we'll skip, um, do cache and resume and troubleshooting before coming back to Secure Platform to finish on that um, at the end of today's session. So channels. Um, we've spoken about channels quite a lot already. Um, so channels are these key data structures. Um, it allows for the implementation of the reactive, functional, orientated comp computational workflows, uh, which are based on the data flow paradigm, programming paradigm. Um, what all this really means is that it allows you to connect up different processes and pass data between them. Um, because it is this sort of data structure, you can choose how this data is, is sort of shaped um, and how it is being passed between these channels. So you can sort of ask it to be grouped or flattened or different ways, um, you know, sort of you can choose how it should pass between um, different processes, different tasks. While we have spoken about um, channels um, to some degree, we haven't really spoken about the different types of channels. So there are two types of channels. We have queue channels and value channels. And there is sort of one big difference uh, that is quite important. And I am going to labor quite hard, um, especially at the start of today's um, session, is that queue channels um, are consumed while value channels are not. So what does this mean? So queue channels, um, they're asynchronous, unidirectional, um, and they're FIFO. So what this really means is that their uh, operations are not blocking, the data flows from a producer to a consumer, and that the data is guaranteed to be delivered in the same order as it is produced. Um, so first in, first out. Um, these are the properties of a queue channel. To create a queue channel, um, sometimes these channels are created implicitly. So when you have a process, the output of a process will implicitly be a queue channel. So by default, these will be a queue channel. But you can also use channel factory. So things such as channel.of or channel.from path. So here, um, this is an example of a queue channel. So channel.of, one, two, and three. So one, two, and three different elements. Um, they would spawn separate tasks. If you were to view these, you'll see that um, the output is expected to be one, two, and three. A value channel, on the other hand, is also known as a singleton channel. Um, these are not consumed, so these can be read multiple times. To create a value channel, you can use the um, channel factory um, value, 
or by using operators that return single values such as first, last, collect, count, min, max, reduce, and sum. What all of this means um, is that this is effectively going to be a single element. So it could be a single number, a single file, a single list. Um, all of these can be consumed multiple times as long as it is a value channel type, not a queue channel type. So I've said a lot of words there, but what does this actually look like? So here we have a snippet, um, which I'm going to copy and paste and just jump over into Gitpod and put this into my snippet.nf here. Um, I just replace this here. <clears throat> um, so just make it a little bit bigger. Hopefully we can see that. Um, but what I have here is we have um, channel of one, two, and three and channel dot of one. So this channel one has three elements and channel two has a single element. But both of these are Q channels because we are using the channel dot of channel factory. Um, so this is what was explained here. The Q channel can be created by using the channel dot of channel factory. Here we have a single process. The process has two inputs, um, X and Y. These are being summed together in the script block and then printed to the output. Down here in the workflow block, we have the process, which is taking channel one and channel two as the two processes. So channel one becomes X and channel two becomes Y as the two inputs. And then we have this view operator on the end which allows the output to be viewed um, in the terminal. So I'm going to run this, um, and just while I type that in, try and have we think about what we're expecting to see. So we have snippet.nf has just run, and we see that there has been a single task, and we have a single output, which in this case is a number two. So what we have is channel two, which is a single number number one, and then here we have the single number number one out of a possible three has been printed to screen. So why has this happened? This is because they're both Q channels. The element one of channel one was consumed the same time as the single element of channel two was consumed, meaning that there was nothing to be matched with these two extra elements in channel one. In other words, Channel Y was exhaustive. Both channels needed to be full for the process to be initiated, for that to be executed, meaning that there was nothing else to sort of drive these processes forward. There was no more data to push this workflow forward. And it was it's a single task. The process was executed once. If we were to change this to a value channel, so this can now be consumed multiple times, we see quite a different behavior. So I've just changed this to value. Um, nothing else has changed in this snippet. We can see that we have four, two, and three. So this has been executed three times. So elements, uh, the three elements of channel one were each added to the single element of channel two. So that's really great. Sometimes um, different outputs or different inputs um, are sort of typed automatically. Um, I mentioned earlier that outputs from a process will implicitly be a Q channel. Um, on the sort of flip side of this, whenever you have a parameter, parameter.channel, we can just make this one, copy that and put that down here as well. So instead of having this channel factory producing the channel, I'm just going to be using um, params to make a parameter out of the number one. Um, this will also be treated like a value channel. So when we run this again, we should see that um, we get three separate numbers being printed to screen. The final sort of manipulation um, that I've just described is using operators. So operators are another way that you can modify um, a channel type. So just turning this back to what we had before. So we've got channel of one, two, and three. Um, and down here, this has still got channel one and two. You'll find down here that we have this exercise. Um, I'm just going to give you a wee minute just to think about um, what this would look like. So in this case, we have, um, you've been asked to add the first operator to create a value channel from channel two. Um, so all three elements of channel one are consumed. So we need to somehow turn this into a value channel um, by using this first operator. 
So it's giving you a very small moment just to think about that, have a quick go at it. Um, you can copy and paste this out to snippet.nf as well. Just in case I've accidentally um, changed something. So the answer here is just to add um, first as an operator, um, in this case, inside the workflow block, uh, and just run that again. So instead of this being executed once because the element is being consumed, um, it will now be consumed multiple times. Great. Um, so that's just really the point I wanted to labor is that there's these two types of channels, queues and values. If you ever have a process uh, which should be run multiple times because, um, you know, it might be files getting mapped back to a reference genome, um, as an example. Um, if your reference genome is not a value channel and it's accidentally a queue channel, it might mean that it's consumed once and you only see it's going to see one um, task being executed. Uh, we see this quite a lot coming up in Slack, um, so it's one of the ones to watch out for. Okay, so moving on to channel factories. Um, Channel factories, of course, are these different commands for creating channels that have implicit um, expected inputs and functions. Um, what I will do here is sort of work through some of the more uh, common channels. Um, there are others online that you can find um, just on the Nextflow documentation. So the first one here is channel dot um, value. So this is a value channel. Um, of course, these are value typed channels. Um, what you'll notice here is that each of these are a single element. So um, in this case, um, you've got this optional not null argument. Um, so this is effectively empty. But here you've got um, hello there, which is a string. So the string is a single element. And here for channel three, we've got um, a list. So one, two, three, four, and five. This is a list. The list is the single element. The next is channel.of. So this allows the creation of uh, queue channels. Um, so we've just been using this as a part of snippet.nf. Um, in this case, we've got one, three, five, and seven. If you were to copy and paste this in, you'd expect the outputs to be one, three, five, and seven um, emitted um, on separate lines. You can do some sort of cool stuff with channel.of as well. So this is an example of how you can use a little bit of Groovy in here. So dot dot uh, will produce all the numbers between one and 23. Um, I'll just copy this one across. So in this case, what we'll see is are the numbers 1 to 23 printed to the screen, uh, to the terminal, um, as well as the X and Y, uh, but you could change this to a different number if you want, um, and it would produce um, numbers between the two numbers at the outside of the dots. From list is another channel factory that you might come across. Um, so this allows you to have a list as an input. Um, I'm just going to copy this across. Um, so again, you can see that I just got this list. I've defined this up the uh, up the top here. I'm just going to add an extra word. Um, so we have this list. It is a single list, which we should have added in here. So list has been defined on line one. Here I am using on line four. I'm just going to click run, and what this will do is print out um, these three words as three separate elements um, into my terminal. From path is another quite common um, channel factory. So this is a way that you can bring in a list of files. Um, so in this case, if you were to go into data, into the meta folder, you'll see these patients underscore one and two. Um, we're using this glob pattern here to try and pick them all up. Running that again, hopefully we'll see these two files um, get picked up. Uh, there's no view. view. Um, so what this will do is just print um, these files to screen. You can see that we've got both of these files um, listed here. So this is a way that you could bring in um, a large number of files from a folder uh, by using a glob pattern. Something that we haven't spoken about to a great extent so far is that a lot of uh, channel factories have options and lots of different options that uh, give you choices about how you want to sort of use that channel factory. Um, so there are things here about glob and type and um, hidden and max depth, uh, follow links and relative, check if exists. All of these can be used to help you choose which files you want to bring as an input. So, you know, as an example, um, you know, the file type or if it's allowed to be hidden or if you're using multiple directory levels, 
um, how many levels are that is the um, channel factory allowed to search through to find find your files. Um, these are all different ways that you can sort of modify the behavior of a channel factory. Uh, if you are trying to do something a little bit creative and it's not quite what you think is is not doing quite what you want, um, I do encourage you to check out the options that are available for different channel factories because um, there should be something that is available um, for you to actually find out, <clears throat> excuse me, for you to use um, to hopefully provide that behavior. We've already used um, from file pairs. Um, this is what we used as a part of the RNA-seq um, proof of concept pipeline. We were bringing in this just GGL data, um, the paired one and two, uh, probably most likely paired end reads, um, just like that. I do quite like this, um, this example though. So just very quickly, we're gonna add that in just to show you what it looks like because there's quite a cool um, activity just down here or an exercise uh, which asks you to apply one of these options to this channel factory um, and then sort of see the different behaviors. So in this case, it's asking you to um, use the flat true and flat false. Um, flat is an option, which is when true, the matching files produced as sole elements in the emitted tuples. So that means that they are produced um, as described here as sole elements rather than as a list um, like you would have seen yesterday. So just quickly to actually show you what that looks like, um, flat, uh, let's start off by going false. So this is the default behavior. When we run this, you'll see that um, we get the same output as we've seen previously, that the two, um, the two read files are a single element. These two items are a single element in, um, in, this, in this sort of channel output. However, if we change this to true, and then hit it again, see what happens. These are now three separate elements um, in this channel. So effectively what this is doing is that while these files were sort of lumped together a list, now it's sort of emitted as separate um, elements and um, you can really run different scenarios and you'll hear about how this would be applicable and useful in different situations. Um, but the idea here is that you do have choices um, about how you create these channels. Um, and as you'll find out later, you can also use operators to help um, sort of manipulate or change how these channels are structured as well. Okay, um, so the final sort of section in this um, this this sort of large section on channels um, is from SRA. So this is an old channel factory that allows you to um, query the NCBI SRA um, archive and return channels emitting the fast queue um, files matching specific selection criteria. Um, so this would be an example where if you had a few files and you were trying to sort of um, run them alongside some public available data, um, you might sort of bring the data in um, using this channel factory. Unfortunately, as a part of um, the Gitpod environment, um, we don't have all of these credentials sort of loaded. However, there are some instructions here that you can go away and load all of this up for yourself um, and implement it as well. Okay, um, so that's the end of the channels section. Uh, what we'll be doing now is moving on to processes. So we've already been using processes a lot, um, both in session one um, as part of the RNA proof of concept and also the hello.nf. Um, you might be quite familiar with kind of some of these words already. So things like directives, inputs, outputs, um, when, uh, which is an optional clause statement, um, and the script block. Um, these are kind of the five main parts of a process. They are always structured in the same way. Uh, so while some of these might be missing, um, effectively you're always expecting, expecting them to see them in the same order. So your process uh, with a name, this will most commonly be in these uppercase letters as I was mentioned in session one, followed by the directives. So again, there are lots of different directives, but these directives uh, can be used for things like containers, um, labels, resource allocation. Um, there are lots of different directives um, that can be applied to each process independently. After that, we have the inputs, which will always have a qualifier followed by the input variable name. Similarly, the outputs will have qualifiers followed by the output um, sort of names or definitions. After that, we have these when, uh, which is where you have these optional conditional statements, followed by 
the script uh, or the shell of the exec block. Uh, most typically, the script um, will be included down here in these triple quotes. In its simplest form, a process only requires a script block. Um, so the script just being a, a string statement or a string, <laughs> string, excuse me, a string statement that defines the command to be executed. Um, this can be wrapped up into the process and then put straight into the workflow. If it doesn't require an input, then it will just be able to be executed um, without causing any extra fuss. Something that we haven't mentioned though is that while the script block will be um, sort of inherently interpreted as bash, you can actually change this. So by adding a shebang to the top of the script block, you can change how this is interpreted. Of course, you'd need to have Python installed um, on the system that this is being executed, um, unless you're providing um, a container with the, with the Python environment installed, lots of different scenarios. Um, but here, for example, this is all Python code. The only difference here is that this has a Python sort of shebang at the top, um, and instead of it being called uh, whatever it was, it's now sort of Pi stuff. So we can copy this and just move this across to Snippet, just replace it in here. Uh, there is Python installed in your Git pod environment. Um, you can see here that this will execute, which is cool. Um, you know, but you could very quickly change this to R, um, I think it's R script or whatever it is, um, Perl, whatever language uh, that you want to type, if you could sort of normally do this in a Linux environment, um, then you can sort of substitute this out here by adding the shebang and include it in your process block. There's quite a nice tip here as well, um, something that I won't um, demonstrate because you've done this already as a part of session one, um, but if you have lots of different scripts, you can store them in a bin folder, which will automatically be mounted so instead of including all of this here, you can make this an executable um, and then just execute it using Python in the script block just to make everything nice and readable. Um, so script parameters, script parameters can be defined dynamically using variable values. Um, so here we've got params.data and we've got world. Um, down here in the script block, we've got um, the variable params.data. So even those defined up here outside of the process, outside of the workflow block, um, this will be made available to the process so that when you uh, run this, it is going to print um, hello world. Um, you can think of parameters as being a little bit special in that they do kind of cross boundaries. You don't need to um, necessarily worry about staging as much with parameters. Um, so parameters um, can be available within script blocks um, if you want them to be. Okay, um, so something that we sort of bridge into in this next um, little block is a little bit about um, the bash syntax and how this can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So uh, since Nextflow uses the same bash syntax for variable substitutions and strings, bash environment variables need to be escaped using the backslash character. Um, the escaped version will be resolved later, returning the task directory, um, in this case using the PWD, um, which would otherwise show the directory where you're running Nextflow. Um, so just to kind of show you this behavior, um, it is something to be mindful of, although you probably won't um, need to include a lot of this in your workflows. Um, here we have PWD, um, which with the backslash, um, it is the work directory. Without it, um, you'll see here we've got this um, slightly different behavior. Um, which in this case is just the training environment which we're actually launching from. So you can see here that um, the backslash is kind of moving in and out um, or escaping um, these bash variables, which is something to be mindful of. The next thing, um, though, is that if you are doing a lot of this, um, for whatever reason, um, you might find it to be more beneficial to use a shell block. Um, so the shell block uses... Um, a slightly different syntax. So instead of using sort of the dollar sign to escape, we've now got um, this exclamation mark to include. You'll also notice here that we have shell rather than script and single quotes rather than triple quotes. So again, just to show you this behavior, um, you'll see that if I was to launch this again, um, 
Uh, I'm just going to add a debug so that we can actually see uh, see the output. So you can see bonjour the bond. Um, so we're going to have um, this X, which is bonjour, and then this being um, Le Monde, which is coming in from the parameters. If you weren't doing this and just trying to include um, params.data, um, like we've done previously, um, just up in here, for example. So params.data. Um, I do need to share that as well, don't I? Um, you'll see that this is going to um, not run particularly well. And give us an error. So it's, a, it's an unbound variable, um, meaning that it doesn't like it. So um, while this is kind of flipped the script and that these environmental variables are kind of treated in a different sense, um, you do need to supply it um, with this. If you are going to be including parameters um, or other variables, um, you'll need to sort of add this exclamation mark with the squiggly brackets um, to kind of, like I said, flip the script on those. Again, this is kind of the, the um, an example that I think it is worthwhile um, going back and trying to break a little bit, seeing what you get away with, seeing what you don't get away with, um, trying to understand these behaviors, what does not doesn't work, um, because this is, most of you won't need to do this as part of your pipelines, but um, I think it's worthwhile just knowing about it, especially if you are trying to sort of escape in and out of bash variables if you're trying to um, do something a little bit tricky with um, naming of files or folders or locations or something like that. Moving on, conditional scripts. So with conditional scripts, you can basically have these if-else um, statements. So as an example here, we have um, params.compress equals gzip. So this is a parameter that is getting set to, to gzip. Um, and then we have some files to compress, uh, which is some data that we've used previously as well from the GGL, the transcriptome.fa uh, file. Here in this process, we have an input, which is the file. And then based on the parameter, um, if it is gzip, it's going to do one thing. So if it's um, bzip2, it's going to do something else. And if it's not known, it's just going to, excuse me, throw an error. Um, down here in the workflow, we just have the process um, taking this input um, and actually using that as a part of the, excuse me, uh, using that as the the input for this, excuse me, sorry, I'm completely confused, is using this params.file to compress, is using the transcriptome file as the input and the parameters being included um, in the script as well because it's a parameter. So again, just to show you this behavior, just going to paste this in. Um, by default, it's been hard-coded to gzip, so this will print gzip. Uh, it'll do params.compress, um, creating the gzip command. However, if we were to try and mix this up by adding in a different parameter on the command line, um, we're just going to say Chris, hitting enter again. Um, you see that this will throw an error because it's not known which is cool. So this is just a way that you can sort of add in some conditionals or another way that you can add in some conditionals to your, uh, to your script block to run different scripts depending on what the inputs are. Um, so there might be scenarios where you want to do different things in different situations. The file is too big or too small or has a particular label. Um, there are lots of different options available um, by using this as well. Okay, moving on to inputs. So um, of course we talked about inputs a little bit already. Um, each input will have a qualifier as well as a name. Um, the name is just an arbitrary value or an arbitrary name, rather will be a way to describe it, um, given to the input. Um, the inputs will most commonly have either a value or a path as a type, um, but effectively it's the qualifier and then the variable name every time. In this example, you'd expect it to have one, two, and three. These are all going to get taken as um, elements being passed into the process, um, in which case it's just going to be echoing out process job one, two, or three. Um, it's quite um, straight. Well, ah, it's completely the wrong script, sorry. Let's get out of that, get rid of this line here. Um, so running this like, like this, this will just print, uh, print job one, two, and three. 
if you get the type wrong, um, generally it will throw an error because it'll be looking for the wrong type um, of, of data. So in this example here, I've just changed from value to path while I'm actually still only passing in values. Um, in this case, um, it's basically just saying that this isn't a valid path type um, and it's thrown an error. This is good for a little bit of checking. Sometimes you might get away with it um, accidentally, depending on if it's path or a value or order is being treated as a string or not. It doesn't really matter. Um, but um, you should be aware of what these are because these can cause you issues if you get the wrong type. Um, generally, a path will always be for files, um, whether a value will be pretty much everything else. So things like um, booleans, as an example, uh, will be treated as a value. Um, so this is an example of where we've got a file input here as well. Um, this is kind of interesting behavior though, so I think this is um, probably a good one to show you as well just quickly. Um, so here we have um, the channel, so the, the data coming from the GGL as well. We know that there's multiple FQ files available. Um, when we run this, um, we will see that we have um, sort of alias sample dot fast Q getting printed multiple fast times. This is effectively because we are not calling the um, the input file by name. All we're doing here is just saying um, for every element that's coming through, print this. Um, so as it says here, um, the process is executed six times. We'll print the name of the file, sample fast queue six times. This is the name of the file and the input declaration. And despite the input file name being different in the execution column, um, lang underscore one, two, three. Excuse me, it's lang underscore one and two, um, gut, um, and liver one and two as well. However, if we give this a, a name, in this case sample, um, rather than the sort of fixed um, name as we have here, um, we'll see that this is actually going to be used as the file name. So what this really means is that um, here, this has been given kind of like a fixed name. It's got the, the single um, quote mark around it. This is effectively, um, it can't be changed. This is, this is what it is. It isn't a variable. Whether here we've got the unquoted sample, um, which means that this can be used as a variable name. This is quite a subtle but important difference. Okay, um, so moving on a little bit, we do need to move a little bit quickly through some of this just to get through um, everything in a reasonable amount of time. Um, we've already seen examples of having combined input channels and the effects of having different channel types. Um, so again, going from channel of one, two, and three, um, previously we've had channel of one. Um, when we try and sort of add these together, um, because these are both Q channels, it's only executed once, so there's one task. Um, however, if you have a value channel, um, it can be executed multiple times, um, as shown here as well. In this exercise, um, of course, all of this also applies to files, not just values. Uh, we've got an example here where we've got these two, um, two different sets of files getting read in. We have one getting turned through the from path channel factory. So this is effectively turning it back into um, a Q channel type. Um, and down here, we're sort of combining this together. So we're still going to have the reads channel um, and the transcriptome channel. Um, in this case, it is going to be the parameters, which is a value channel, as well as the read channel, which is the channel that's been created here as a Q channel, um, meaning that the transcriptome will be applied multiple times, um, but the read channel will only be executed or consumed um, once. So just to show you what this looks like. <clears throat> so you can see here, we've got liver um, one, lung one, and gut one. We're only doing this once for each file. And we've got transcriptome.fa um, for each of them. So the transcriptome file has been reused multiple times, um, but the liver, lung, and gut file has only been used once. I mean, hypothetically, you can start to play around with this. Um, this is something that you might want to play around with this as well. Channel. Ooh. Dot 
of dot set um, transcriptome dot channel so I'm gonna give that slightly longer than the name and it probably needs and then I'm gonna supply this down here these are the types of things you can do just to kind of like find out the limits find out how these things fit together uh, find out how changing the file types or the channel types um, actually affects the output. So here, for example, uh, because I've changed that into a Q channel and added that to the process down here, it's only been executed once. Um, I really do encourage you to play around with stuff like this um, as well. Okay, so input repeaters. This is another um, kind of more interesting um, way that you can sort of um, apply Nextflow. So uh, the each qualifier, um, I've talked about value and path. Each is another qualifier, um, although it isn't used as much. Um, it allows you to repeat the execution of a process um, for each item in a collection every time your data is received. So for example, uh, we have sequence. So from channel, to from path, uh, we have some files coming in. Then we have these two separate methods, regular and espresso. With the each mode, the execution will be repeated uh, for each item in this collection. So the output, we can see that we've got um, regular and espresso. So for each gut, we have regular and espresso. For each lung, we have espresso and regular, or regular and espresso as well, um, and the same for liver. So everything has been done twice with these two separate modes. So you can imagine if you're trying to apply different parameters or add different labels in different ways, um, this could be quite a nice way to um, include um, a series of executions um, by using this each each qualifier. <clears throat> um, so here, this is an example where it's just adding you to add in an additional um, coffee type. Um, so you can add this up in here into the methods um, and see what the outputs would look like. Um, be careful not to add too many or this will become um, quite large quite quickly. Okay, so outputs are very similar to inputs in that you can have these um, qualifiers with the name. Um, however, there is a little bit of difference here. You can also have this emit. So you can add a comma followed by emit with a colon, um, and then you can give this output a name. Um, and we'll see very shortly how this can be applied as well. So again, we've got um, quite a simple example. We've got a greeting, so taking hello world. This is going to get passed into the process as an input, which in this case is a value. And this is just taking an output, which is a value as well. Um, so again, this is really just about um, the output block goes beneath the input block and above the script block. Um, and you just need to make sure that you've got these um, qualifiers um, that match the data type as well. When it is a um, file, um, this is an example down here under 6.3.2 where the path qualifier specifies um, the file that is going to be produced. When it is a sort of fixed in quotes um, output, this will be the exact named file. So the file has to be named this or it won't be collected as an output. So this is actually quite a neat wee example uh, where it is just gonna be taking in um, a random number. Notice the backslash here to actually escape and allow us to use this bash variable. It's going to be put into results.txt, which has been collected as the output, um, as the file name, so that when we actually execute this, um, what we should see is a string to this, this folder being presented um, in our output. And if we were to try and cat this, um, so just copy and paste to see, you'll see that a random number has been written to that file as well. Okay, um, so this is a slightly, um, or probably an extension of what I've just shown you as well. When you've got uh, multiple output files, so much like we saw with the hello um, example, hello.nf example in session one, um, when you have multiple files, you can add just a glob pattern to pick these up um, using a path as well. So you can imagine if you are trying to collect, um, you know, all the BAM files or all the index files or whatever is an output from a particular tool, 
um, you could use a glob pattern like this to try and capture all of those as a single um, output um, for your channel. Um, so here, this is actually applying an operator. We haven't really spoken about operators um, in enough detail um, at this point to dig into this in great detail, um, but this is potentially an exercise that um, you might want to come back and look at later. So um, this next section here, dynamic output file names. Um, again, this is an important example, which I think is worth highlighting. So in this snippet, we've got um, a few different things. I'm just going to copy and paste this across. Uh, we've got a species, um, cat, dog, and sloth, all the way up some sequences. Uh, we've got a channel from list here. So this will be a Q channel, and it's making it into um, species underscore ch. We have this align process, which is taking two different inputs, um, a value x and a value seek. Um, these are both the variable names that you can see that they've got the dollar signs down here um, so that you know that they're variables. The output we're using dynamically. So we have x. x in this case is going to be the value um, x as well. So this has been used in both places. Um, you can do this. Because we have it here with the dollar sign inside the double speech marks um, with the with the um, curly brackets um, sort of enclosing it, it means that we can use it in this sort of um, in this in a way that we can have it um, right next to in this case a suffix, um, so the file type, um, and we can use it here as the output and also down here in the script block, meaning that we can get these dynamic names produced. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is just save this again and then just run it. And we'll see is the outputs from this particular process um, all being fed um, out here. We've got slop align, cat align, and dog align. So these value inputs, which in this case are the species, um, we've been able to use these to dynamically name the file outputs. Um, Again, you can get really creative with how you want to do this. You could have a couple of these in here. If we had, um, you know, other other names or other file types, um, you can you can sort of really mix and match with all of this. Um, you have lots of different options. Um, this is another good one for you to come back and play with. Um, work out what you can get away with, um, what breaks, why it breaks. Um, take your time to. Um, think about it, update it, um, keep improving your understanding. Great. Um, so you see here, this is kind of um, something that I've alluded to a little bit already, how you can sort of have these combina combinations um, of inputs and outputs. Um, in reality, you can have, you know, sample ID used here as a value in the tuple for both the input and the output. Sample ID is something that you'd commonly want to sort of carry through um, every different sort of process with you. So if you're trying to sort of keep track of what these files are, they can continuously change name. You might have different pieces of metadata buried in here as well. Um, so even though the file is changing, the file type is changing, the name of the file is changing, uh, by sort of keeping it paired to something like a sample ID can be really helpful, um, which in this case is something you can sort of see here as well, is that even though all these files are sample.bam, which of course, because they're all getting executed in isolated task directories, um, it doesn't matter if they're called the same thing, um, but you want to just make sure that they're labeled properly using something like um, an ID. Um, so again, this is just an example um, where it's asking you, excuse me, an exercise where it's asking you to modify the script um, so that the sample file name is given as a sample ID. Um, so you can see here that this has been updated um, to produce the sample ID. Um, again, the same sample ID is up here, so this variable has been used um, now in three separate places, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, so output definitions. Um, <clears throat> you can also explicitly define the output of a channel using the out attribute. Um, so this is something that hasn't been um, shown to um, to you in a lot of detail just yet. So down here on line 20, um, we've got file.out.view. So this is going to be taking um, the output of foo um, and showing you what that looks like. 
So in this case, I'm just going to be pasting all of this in again, um, just to show you. Oh, I missed something out there. Oh, of course, yeah, so I was too tricky for myself. Um, so here, for example, we have um, foo, um, but we have these two outputs because we've got two different outputs. Um, we might need to index that uh, just to choose which of the two we're going to be using. Um, in this case, we're going for one, which is the second position um, because um, the indexing starts at zero. If we were to change this to zero, um, so while these were the, the BAI, um, the dot .by files, changing this back to zero uh, means that we'll pick up these BAM files. So these are positional um, zero and one, uh, BAM and, and BY. The other alternative way to do this, um, a way that is more sort of commonly used, is by adding um, an emit, which is basically um, how you can name um, these outputs. So here, for example, we're going to add bam and by to both of these. Now, instead of having to use um, square brackets with an index, we can use dot alt dot bam and see what that looks like. <clears throat> so again, um, just to show you that we can um, use the other one as well. Um, but now we can add in these dot bam and dot by after the dot out when we're trying to specify the exact output um, from a channel. So this is especially important when you have multiple outputs. Um, so here, for example, I could just create a whole new output as well. Um, this doesn't have to be the same um, structure. Um, there's a lot of flexibility about how this should look. So if you're like me, you might want to try and line that up um, just because you can. And then down here, we are going to add this in as well um, again you can just you can keep playing with these examples to find out what does and doesn't work um, try and work out why it does and doesn't work um, think about how this might relate to your own data um, there's a lot of cool things you can do here um, you just have to sort of play around enough to define them sometimes okay um, so when the when declarations allow you to define a condition that must be verified in order to execute the process um, so here, for example, we've got basically a test um, to look at the file um, and make sure that um, it's the right type. Um, you will find um, these are quite common in NF4 pipelines, for example, just checking a few things to make sure that it, it is what you think it is. Um, but ultimately, um, this might not be something that you need to add into your different processes. A lot of people don't, um, unless you're really checking for things, um, which of course can be good practice um, to make sure that you are executing what you think you're executing. Cool. Finally, um, so this section we also have the directives. Um, the directives um, are these sort of optional um, definitions, optional settings that affect the execution. Um, so here we have an example of CPUs 2, memory 1.8 um, gigabytes in a container. Um, you don't need to add these, but they can be really helpful to add them to a process, um, especially things like labels, so you can flexibly apply configuration options to um, specific sets of processes. Um, you can do all of this using um, directives. Uh, we've seen CPUs before, um, also containers yesterday as a part of session one. A little bit about the resource allocation, though. Um, so... Um, here are some of the big ones, so CPUs, time, memory, and disk. Um, there's a few instructions here about how you can actually uh, write these um, and also what units you can use um, when you are executing these as well. Um, so here, for example, we've got um, just another snippet with process foo, CPUs 2, memory 1.8 gigabytes, time 1 hour, um, and 10 um, gigabytes of disk. 
one of the directives you'll probably use most often is the publish directory. So this is where the results will actually be published. Um, as you might remember that a lot of these processes are uh, included, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or will be executed in the work directories and you actually need to tell Nextflow to publish these somewhere if you want to keep a copy of those results outside of those work directories. In this case, you've got the publish directory, um, which is going to be set to results. So the folder name um, and then the files you are picking up using this pattern uh, with the glob pattern in there. Um, so for example, uh, while we do have the outputs here with the, with the BAM files, um, these will get collected uh, and put into results folder. Just to show you what this looks like. So what we should see in here is we have the results folder um, with these three BAM files that have been picked up. Um, by using this here. Uh, just to show you that you can change this as well. Um, or you can even add multiple um, multiple published directories um, depending on where you want to store these things. So I'm just going to go bam and buy just to align those up. We can run that again. Um, so, you know, you can be really clever about how you want to do this. Um, so here we've got these two different folders now, um, clicking different file types. Um, you can add lots of different files and folder types um, to really sort of like fine tune about where you want to um, sort of um, store these. You know, you can get really creative, um, as I said. Also use these variables from the inputs and outputs um, to name these and put them in different places as well. So you, you have lots of options. Um, and it actually can be quite a bit of fun, like coming with creative ways um, about how you want to uh, put these different places as well. Okay, um, so that's everything for processes. So what we'll do now is move on to operators. So operators are methods that allow you to manipulate channels and every operator um, with the exception of set and subscribe uh, produces one or more new channels, um, allowing you to chain them to basically fit your needs. Um, so when I say mean chain, um, you can keep sort of stacking operators on top of each other um, as we've seen to a degree um, elsewhere already as well. There are seven main sort of groups, um, even though the last group is other, which is kind of just kind of mopping up everything else. Um, but there are operators for filtering, transforming, splitting, combining, forking, um, maths, um, and as I said, other, which is this kind of everything else. What we will do is kind of just work through, um, first of all, a basic example, and then some of the commonly used operators. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the, the operators that are out there um, and how they work. So map, um, map is a really common operator, and we will come back to map under the commonly used operators um, in a few minutes, um, but it allows you to apply a function of your choosing to every item um, emitted by a channel. Um, so in this example, we have channel of um, one, two, three, and four. We can use um, the channel, it's called nums, and we can use the map operator to take each of these numbers and then square it by itself. So in this case, we just have um, each of these getting admitted as um, a single item, and then that item is getting times by itself. And we've just got this wee arrow here, um, sort of saying, this is what's coming in, and this is what I want you to do with it. Um, finally, we're just gonna add the view operator to actually view this as well. This is just a, another sort of schematic representation of that, as they have these numbers coming in, uh, one, two, three, and four. So it's gonna be one times one is one, two times two is four, three times three is nine, four times four is 16. Um, as I said earlier, they can also be chained. Um, so in reality, this is actually um, a chain. So we've got um, the map and view operator um, one after another. Starting off with these commonly used operators, um, we have been using the view operator pretty much since the first minute of uh, this workshop. So the view operator will just print um, items emitted by a channel to the console standard output. Um, appending a new line character um, to each item, which is why we sort of see them separate out across those multiple lines. 
So then we have the channel.of with the dot view. The channel factory is dot of, the operator is dot view. Um, we can print these to screen. In this case, it would be foobar and baz um, on three separate lines. An optional closure um, can be used here as well. So you'll notice that we do have the round brackets here and then the squiggly brackets um, here. When we use the squiggly brackets, it's treated like a closure, which means that you can actually add some customization to it, which you can't when it is the round brackets. So just showing you this as an example, we'll get rid of all of that. Uh, next flow run snippet. Um, all of this has been prepended with just a little dash at the start. Um, and you can see that if you started trying to use um, round brackets for this, it will throw an error. <clears throat> um, but you could also make this back to its a simple version, which would just be um, oops, even that. Making a mess of this. Um, just like this. So you, you can simplify it again. Um, question is this. Again, you can just be really creative um, with this as well. Um, it's quite a nice way of reporting, or if you're trying to annotate something that you're trying to view, um, this can be quite a nice way of doing it, um, especially while you're developing and debugging. So the map operator is another one which you will most likely use um, almost every day if you're developing uh, with Nextflow every day. The map operator applies a function of your choosing to every item emitted by a channel um, and returns the item attained as a new channel. So in this example here, um, we've got channel um, hello.world. We're taking each um, element, each item, um, is going to get passed through. And here we're using a little bit of Groovy, so we're adding um, this function to each item. And it's going to be, in this case, uh, reversing um, these strings for us. So again, I'm just going to show you that you can do this. So it's the hello world. Um, it's giving us um, the reverse of those two um, print to our screen out there. Um, of course, you could just remove this as well, um, and it would go back to normal and just produce um, hello world. You can also get a little bit um, creative and do more interesting and dynamic things. So you can um, associate a generic tuple to each element um, and sort of decide what you want to add to that. So this is an example here where we're going to take um, the two words, so the same hello world that we've just been using, and by using map, we're actually going to be creating a tuple, um, but in position one, we'll have the string itself, and then after that, we'll have the size of that string. So we can add some here. Um, and add this again. And in reality, we can um, keep adding stuff in here. We don't have to limit um, size. We can keep um, adding in as much as we want here. Uh, you know, we can just start going crazy if you want and do strange things like that. But um, you have options. Um, you have lots of um, flexibility about how you can use maps. Maps are sometimes referred to as sort of the Swiss army knife of um, of, of Groovy uh, that allows you to do all these crazy things, all these interesting things. Um, and enclosures, um, particularly with map, is, is a way of doing that. Okay, um, so here's just an example where you can use the, the dot name um, method to get the file name um, and print that out as well um, when you're using um, the GGL uh, FastQ files as an input. Um, again, this might be quite a nice exercise for you to go back um, and try when you've got a little bit more time because um, I think it is quite a cool one. Um, and of course, you can get creative and, and do different things, different dynamic naming or, or just whatever takes your fancy. Okay, um, so 
the mix um, operator helps you to combine um, items submitted by two or more channels. So in this example, you can um, have one channel and then mix in another so that everything is kind of combined into one sort of streamed output. Um, so as an example of this, um, let's just add that in here. Um, we're just going to change this to set. Um, mixed channel. Stop channel for you. So what we're doing here is we are mixing channels one, two, and three. All three of those are going to be mixed together. Um, I have then set this or made this into a brand new channel. So all of those things are now sort of um, combined all together as a single channel, meaning I can feed all of this into one process as a single input. Flatten is um, almost the opposite. <clears throat> in that, in this case, we have uh, two lists, um, which I'm going to show you with and without the flatten operator. So if you were to look at these uh, by themselves, we've got these two inputs, one, two, and three, four, five, and six. Without flatten, you see both of these um, separately. But if we were to, oh, sorry, flatten, um, add that back in here, you'll see that we get quite a different output. Um, in this case, a typo. Save that and enter it again. You'll see that the items in these lists have been flattened out um, all into one um, sort of output, one stream of output. Um, as we do with the last, we could make this into a brand new channel. Um, set um, out dot channel out underscore channel. Uh, I find it quite nice to look at outputs like this sometimes, just so you can see that um, you could, in fact, set this as a new channel and then feed this into a pipeline separately. Um, all of these would be treated as different elements. So these two lists have been flattened out um, and also sort of merged together now into that single channel. <clears throat> the opposite of this is um, collect. So if you had a, a, a series of elements, you want to collect them into a single list for whatever reason, um, you could use the collect operator, and that would, would literally do the opposite of what we've just done and actually merge those up into a list again. Things can get quite complicated when you have um, lots of different tuples, um, especially if you are trying to use things like matching keys. So if you um, thinking of a real-life example, if you had um, you know a sample and you wanted to split this out into all the different chromosomes and then process all of those individually, and then merge them back together all based on the sample ID, um, you need to think about how this might work with tuples. So here we have a channel of 1A, 1B, 2C, 3B, um, 1C, 2A, and 3D, and then we can group these. We're just going to take the first, um, excuse me, um, it's going to basically click them based on the first um, part of each of these, so the, for the key. Um, and then everything else will be kind of just merged into a list after that. <clears throat> Again, this could be an example where you're trying to, um, you know, collect all your fast queues back up or your um, or your band files back up after being aligned individually, and then merge them into one big. Like, I I don't know. There's there's lots of different scenarios um, that you might want to do this. Um, but here, this is quite a nice example as well. So in this exercise, um, so this is something you might want to do as well, is that we have from path to create a channel emitting all of the files in the folder de uh, data meta, so we can see that here in the solution. Then the map is used to associate the base name method, so this is a little bit of um, Groovy coming in here. And then we're going to add that to each file as well. <clears throat> so in this case we've actually used um, tuple with round brackets. Uh, we could have also used square brackets in here. So just sorry, just to show you what I'm actually talking about. 
Uh, so we can run this and it'll be taking um, the base name from these files, um, grouping them and giving us back um, this structure here. Um, but what I also could have done would have been uh, file.base. Um, something like that might have worked as well. All too creative, my own good. Not too many there. It adds it in for me, doesn't it? <clears throat> uh, it's not going to work. Um, you can see that you can get a little bit creative here, but you do need to be careful that you're not just adding in um, too much sort of extra admin and creating issues for yourself when you don't need to, like I am right now. Uh, anyway, um, you can sort of get creative about how you want to do this as well. So similarly, um, much like group tuple, there's also join. Um, so join works in a similar way, but um, with a distinct sort of difference. Um, the join operator creates a channel that joins together the item submitted by two channels with a matching key. Um, by default, it's the first element in each um, item submitted. Um, so you can sort of see we've got X, um, Y, Z, and P, and Z, Y, and X. Um, because P didn't have anything to match with, match with when you have the output, um, it's effectively missing because there was nothing for it to join on. It has to join. Um, so it's not quite as flexible as um, group tuple. <clears throat> branch. Um, branch is quite a cool operator as well. So branch allows you to forward the item submitted by a source channel to one or more channels. Um, so you can effectively branch it based on some sort of test um, or logic. Um, so in this case, we've got um, a channel of a series of numbers, and then we're branching them into big and small numbers um, based on if they are bigger or smaller than 10. Um, and then here we're just going to print those out. Um, just to show you what this looks like, um, you can run this again. Uh, one of the questions we quite often get is what happens if you do have the number 10 itself. I'll let you have a quick prediction before I run that again. It's completely um, ignored. So because it's not bigger or smaller than 10, it's ignored from this. Um, however, I think if you do, um, I might have to scram the wrong way. Um, when you have it sort of less than or equal to, um, not equal to or less than, um, it does get picked up, so it just has to be, um, you have to be a little bit careful about how you set up these these tests as well. Ah, there you go. There's already a note in there. Um, I've done this one before. Okay, so um, that's really kind of just a very brief introduction to a number of different operators. Um, as I've been preaching throughout already, um, I do think it's worthwhile going back and playing around with these in your own time as well. Um, what I was aiming to do here is just show you that there are lots of different types of um, operators, um, and I do really encourage you to go back um, potentially to this this sort of um, listing at the top here and have a dig into some of these, think about what they do, think about how you might want to apply them, um, but also you might not know that you need these until you're in some weird situation where you think, okay, I need to do this crazy sort of manipulation, um, but these, these do exist, um, do go and check them out. There are also a series of operators for dealing with text. Um, so we have, in this case, a file of random text coming from um, the random.txt file, and we have this split text operator. Um, what this allows you to do is split multi-strings, multi-line strings into um, chunks containing uh, different numbers of um, different different numbers of letters or lines or, or whatever else you want to include it. Um, so here, for example, um, we could just split this out, um, this text file. Uh, we can split this out into um, separate, separate lines to be fed through um, a different process if that's what we're trying to do. You can also sort of choose how you want to apply this. Um, so you can start to modify these operators as well. So you can use by 
um, as a part of this operator. And what this will do is allow you to um, group these letters um, by lines of two. Um, so here uh, we can see that this has all been like single lines. I can add that back in here and show you that when we do it this way, we can group them by um, lines of two, uh, which is quite neat as well. So you can, you can imagine that there might be situations where you've got like a sample sheet or some other input um, that you want to validate or do something with and you want to sort of read in the text file. Um, so you might need to think about using an operator like split text. <clears throat> You can see here as well that you can sort of put on, um, in this case, a closure afterwards um, to modify it again. In this case, we've got a closure, um, which is going to take um, the item and convert it to upper or uppercase letters as well. So this is kind of a game where you sort of have this, this intermix of a little bit of groovy and a little bit of uh, next flow sort of working with each other um, to do cool things. The next operator is split. CSV. Um, so this is a situation where you might have a CSV file. Um, so over here in, in the data, we're going to have data. Uh, was it in, uh, in here? Yep. We've got like patient one, for example. So this is a CSV comma separated um, values. Um, all of this is sort of being separated here. Uh, just pointing out as we go past that this does have column names. Um, this will be uh, relevant soon. When you split this out, you can first of all use indexing. So you can sort of say, you know, row zero, row three, um, and then choose what this should look like. So um, you can start to choose the rows and columns that you want to pull this from. So while we're still splitting out the CSV, we're just pulling out the two, um, the two columns, in this case, the, the very first column, and then the uh, fourth column, Indexed by zero and three, um, just for each of the different lines. Um, row in this case, of course, is a name that we've given to each of the different rows or each of the different elements um, created by split CSV. The reason I pointed out the header before is that when a CSV begins with a header, um, you can specify the parameter header equals true, which allows you to reference each value by its column name. So instead of using this indexing like we've just done here, we can use header equals true, um, and then just refer to these using um, those header names. So again, we can do something like this, um, and this will give us the, the same um, output, which is cool, um, which is a really nice um, feature because it means that if you do have like a labeled sample sheet, um, so something that you might be putting onto an Illumina sequencer or another platform already, um, you can choose which columns um, straight away without having to work out what the indexes are, which does make life a little bit easier. Excuse me, um, and also less chance for errors that way as well. Um, of course, if there wasn't a, a header already, you can provide a custom header um, with names by specifying it as a list string um, in the header parameter, um, as shown in this example here. And then you can also use that again um, as the indexes. Uh, when you're actually trying to view these um, as shown in the example again. Um, you can also process multiple CSVs at the same time. Um, so again, we've just changed this to a glob pattern um, and all this will get picked up in the same way and you can sort of add all of these at once. Um, again, you can imagine a situation where you've got a lot of different files um, which have kind of been created or you're trying to like go through a series of sample sheets and do something, um, this is an option that might be might be relevant to you. <clears throat> okay, um, so this is quite a comprehensive example, um, one that I won't do, um, but I think it is a cool example if you do want to challenge yourself. Um, so this example here is create a CSV file that can be used to input, uses an input for script seven. So what would you include in the sample sheet and then how would you apply that um, to actually bring in the samples for the proof of concept RNA-seq pipeline um, for script seven. Um, the example here is just one possible um, solution. Um, you might have another one. Again, this is an opportunity to explore and work out um, what you're trying to do um, and the limits that you can sort of, um, sort of work between as well. 
Uh, it's worth noting here as well that um, while we have been looking at CSVs, you can also use TSD files. Um, we're pretty much identical the same way. You just need to use the um, a different separator um, as an option for this operator. Um, it's quite straightforward. Uh, it's a nice exercise and explanation with example there. Excuse me, exercise um, an example there. Um, finally, we have the split JSON. Um, so you can pass JSON file format using the split JSON channel operator. Um, again, you might not need to do this, um, but this is available to you. So you don't need to go write, go away and write some um, Groovy code to do this for you. Um, there is an operator here to help you with that straight away. Um, and this is just a nice big long um, kind of example here of how this might look um, if this was JSON's files and um, different inputs and outputs and things like that, um, which is quite nice. Okay, so after this, we're going to be moving on to modularization. Modularization is actually one of my favorite sections um, in the training because I think it's really um, an important part of sort of pipeline and workflow development where we sort of stop, you know, writing these big monolithic scripts and start to really sort of compartmentalize our code um, and think about the best way to make things readable and accessible. Um, and as part of Nexo, reusable um, in our pipelines. So modules basically, um, or the modularization really kind of kicked off with Nextflow um, with the introduction of DSL2, um, which allowed for the definition of standalone module scripts, um, which could be shared across um, all of these workflows. So as a part of this, what you can do is use this um, include statement. Um, which allows you to effectively bring in some code from another file and include it as if it was a part of your main Nextflow script. So what we'll be doing is we'll be using this hello.nf example um, and sort of modularizing it um, in a way that allows us to move the processes outside of the, the hello.nf script. So um, over here, I have my hello.nf. Um, this is exactly the same as what you used yesterday as a part of session one. Next flow run hello.nf. Um, if you have carried on with your same environment from session one, um, it might be easier to, let's just put a copy of it here. I don't think we do. Um, you might need to either take some of this with a grain of salt, um, or I recommend starting a new GitPod environment so that you don't have any sort of weird artifacts left over uh, for anything you might have done in the previous um, session. Um, so with, in this case, a clean sort of starting from scratch, um, hello.nf uh, example, um, it is still a working pipeline that is taking a string and then just splitting it out into these um, separate separate files and then converting them um, into uppercase letters. What I'm going to do though, is move these processes out of this file. This is the modularization I've been talking about. So for that, I'm going to create a new um, file. I'm just gonna check if we've actually called it anything specific in here, uh, modules.nf. So here, um, I'm just gonna type in code um, you could also just go up here and create a new file and call it modules.nf as well. I quite like just going modules.code.modules.nf and opening up a new tab here. Make sure you do save it. I'll just hit command save. What I'm now going to do is completely take um, both of these and put them in here. Now I'm going to delete them. So if I was to try and run this right now, um, it's gonna fail because the processes aren't included, even though they are in this file that's sitting just next door. To fix this, what I need to do is add in um, these includes, um, include split letters from modules.nf. This is a relative path. So um, if you've created a new file, it needs to be right next door uh, in the same directory. I'm now going to import both of these processes. So these named processes convert to upper and split letters and make them available. 
So now when I run it like this, um, it works just the same, which is great. So I managed to modularize it. My main workflow is now much smaller, which is great because if you could imagine if I've got 30 processes in here already, the last thing I want to do is have an excess of, you know, an extra 15 to 30 lines per um, process at the top of the single file. Now they can all be excluded across multiple files, um, just like this. Um, I'm a lot happier as a developer. Um, so that's effectively what I have just done there already uh, with those same files. Now, because I have both of these files in the same modules.nf file, I can actually shorten this um, like so, which means I can remove an entire line. So because both of these are in the same file, um, I don't actually need to have them as two separate lines. I could just do... Um, this. <clears throat> Again, they're still working, so you can add them in this the multiple lines just using a semicolon. Um, I don't think this will be in the um, in the training material, but just to show you what this would look like as well, um, if you had. Uh, multiple files like this. Like goldfish, I've completely forgotten already. So we've got extra, convert to upper. Extra, go like that. I like to have things nice and square like that. Ooh. Close that again. Um, so what I've done here is I've effectively um, just moved this out into two files. I didn't have to do this, um, but I just wanted to show you that you could, in theory, have lots of different include statements, one after another, um, going up and down here as well, if that's what you so wanted to, to do. So I'll just add everything back there, um, just reverted the changes I made. The next thing that can be quite useful and also quite important is aliases. So you can include a module multiple times, but only if you use an alias. So for example, if I was trying to um, include both of these processes, so split letters and convert to upper twice, if I was trying to include them as split leaders and convert the upper without aliases, um, we're going to have some trouble. So just to show you um, what the what the bad situation looks like. Um, so I'm trying to um, execute both of these like this. Um, so we've got the same processes trying to execute them multiple times within the same workflow block. Um, and you can see here that I can't because it's already been used. Um, this is partly because of the naming when it comes to the processes that are being executed um, by Nextflow. However, to kind of circumvent this, to work around this, you can use aliases. So you can import or include the same module multiple times. Um, the same process multiple times, but it's giving them a separate name. So here, for example, I'm just going to run this again. Um, and what we should see is that this will run um, and that they're actually getting known by their process names. Um, split letters one, convert to upper one, split letters two, convert to upper two. Um, so aliases allow you to um, use the same module or process multiple times um, by just giving them a different name uh, to be known by. Uh, so the next thing here um, is the output definitions. Uh, so Nextflow allows the use of alternative output definitions within workflows to simplify your code. Um, here you can see that we have, um, you know, effectively 
the same script, but you know, line here we've got um, channels of params.greeting. Um, here we have the channel name greetings.channels or greetings underscore channels, sorry, excuse me. Um, so we can just include this here like this. And then the outputs of that, instead of taking uh, basically the named or like creating a new named channel um, or setting a new named channel, uh, we can just use dot out to take the output from this process um, and feed it straight into the next process without actually sort of using all of these um, equals or sets. Um, of course, as already shown, you can use the indexing, so 0, 1, 2, depending on um, which one it is. And if you've used emit, then you can use um, naming as well. So jumping down here to this example, um, um, this of course is going back, uh, so we're no longer using modules.nf, um, but in this case what we've done is we have um, added in this emit, um, so the standard output emit um, is going to be called upper, and we can see here that we've called the output upper here. So just to show you that this is a working um, pipeline. <clears throat> um, so we can see that it does work like this. Um, we could also just use out in this instance because um, we only have one output from this. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be named when you have a single output um, either. Something that is less common, um, I don't do this much myself, however I know others um, like it a lot, is that you can pipe. So when you have these sort of single outputs, instead of applying dot out, um, you can just put in this pipe um, to basically feed them from one to another. Um, it's also slightly easier, or some people find it easier because it's uh, more intuitive, uh, but you'll sort of see here how you have this blend of, blend of a channel factory, um, the process, you also have an operator, um, another process, another operator. Um, all of these are used quite interchangeably. Um, this can take a little bit more time and practice to get your head around. Um, it's not something that I, like I said, it's not something that I do um, very often. Okay, um, so that's kind of like a, a quick whirlwind of modularization. Um, the thing I just wanted to point out um, again is that you can uh, really externalize um, these modules, these processes, and also give them aliases if you so need to because you're using the same um, process multiple times. You shouldn't need to completely duplicate the entire process um, just to use it twice, just give it an alias, um, save yourself a lot of time and, and energy um, and maintenance having to look after that as well. Something that will be new um, are these workflow definitions. So the workflow scope allows a definition of components that define um, the invocation of one or more processes or operators. Um, so here we have the entire workflow um, wrapped up in this workflow definition. Um, and then that is getting called down here in this second uh, workflow uh, block. The biggest difference here is that its workflow um, definition has a name, whether down here it doesn't, it's just invoking um, the workflow that has been given a name above. There is a slightly different way of writing this. So workflows um, have take rather than inputs. So in this case, it is taking greeting. Um, and you can see here that it's basically fed in to the main sort of script, much like you'd expect to see in the workflow um, in the same way that we've seen previously. So this, this greeting, uh, which can be thought of like a channel, um, has been put into split letters, which is being um, used as the output. The output of split letters is being used and convert to upper, um, which is then getting used in the convert to upper um, .view.it. Um, if you are trying to um, run the script, just make sure that you do have these includes um, there, as well as the, the modules.nf still in working um, function. So my... Um, modules.nf is still, um, everything looks okay there. Um, however, this doesn't work because I need to um, actually supply an entry, um, which is something I haven't spoken about. So 
when you try and um, excuse me, run a workflow like this, you do need to find an entry point, um, which in this case needs to be the name of the workflow that you are trying to, um, which you are executing with. Um, so in this case, what I will do is entry my workflow, um, and you'll be able to jump in here like this. Reading just because I don't have this down here. Apologies. Don't know if we talk about entry just yet. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Wasn't paying attention. Um, so we have this workflow block here, but I actually needed to add in the second uh, workflow um, down here where we actually call my workflow. Um, we've also got a groovy issue here. So my workflow channel of params. Greeting, which looks fine. It's because this isn't added into that block. <clears throat> That's better. Um, so just to clarify what was going on there, um, basically um, this wasn't the complete code block. I used also need to add in the workflow down here to actually, um, you know, call the workflow and also add in what is going to be um, what is being taken, what is being used as the input. Um, the other thing which I hadn't updated here is because I used this um, dot upper, I had never updated my modules uh, over here um, to include um, emit upper, um, which means that that failed. Um, so I just have to keep an eye on that. The rest of this block as well in case i need to actually just add that in okay um so workflow outputs um much like inputs the workflow can declare one or more output channels um, using the emit statement um so here this is the hello.nf workflow again we've got the two processes um, we've got the workflow blocks we've got the take which is greeting and also the emit which is convert to upper um this is be given as the main output for the workflow so this is um, more or less identical to the same workflow as, as before. Um, I'm no longer using uh, I'm no longer using the modules.nf, um, but we now have this emit, which is effectively allowing us to use .out .view. Um, so out is coming from my workflow, from the workflow um, with the emit as the output. And then view, of course, is just going to view this as well. So again, this is it's a convoluted example, um, but you can imagine that if you had a series of different sort of steps in here as a part of main, um, you could sort of start to add these and stack these up as well. Okay. Um, you can see here as well, we've got these um, named outputs um, for the emit. In this case, we're just going to call it my data. And you can see down here, we've got my data um, in here again. So what I'm going to do is just add in my data. My data dot view. Um, so much like we've had MIT previously, um, when we've added the MIT to the output uh, definition for a process, um, here we've done this using emit for the workflow definition, um, but we can also call that um, down here in the actual workflow block as well. Um, so again, um, this does seem like there is more to learn and it's more complicated, but what I'd really encourage you to think about is that how this will affect an entire workflow if you have everything organized like this. So when the example isn't relatively simple or clear, and you have lots of different tools doing lots of different things with lots of really long scripts, it's nice to have all of this isolated out because it means that um, it's much more reasonable, findable, excuse me, readable, findable, um, reusable. Um, you will love yourself much more if you, if you have your code compartmentalized. So this is the little bit um, of code that I got a little bit confused about before, um, about calling named workflows. 
So when you have multiple named workflows that you're then calling in your sort of main workflow, um, you can use an entry point um, by using this sort of uh, entry flag with the workflow name. So as an example of this, um, I'm just going to paste this in here. Uh, we've got um, split letters one and two, convert to upper one and two, as well as these two workflows, which is going to be calling um, all the ones and all the twos um, separately. And then we have down here in the main workflow, uh, we have workflow one and workflow two. When you use entry, you can choose which of these workflows you would like to use. Um, so as an example of that, I'm just going to change this to hello and run this again. What this will do is it'll give us all the split letters ones because I used workflow one as an entry. But if I was to change this to two, um, you'll see that all the twos have been executed um, because I've used entry point two. So you have a little bit of choice about which of these you want to use um, as a part of your main.nf file and you can include them um, selectively. Uh, we can execute them selectively using an entry point. Okay, so that takes us to the end of modularization. Um, and we're going to move on to configuration. The next few sections uh, get a little bit hypothetical. Um, I will try and keep things moving quite quickly and give you as many examples and um, more live demos as I can. Um, however, some of this is a little bit tricky to demonstrate as a part of the GitPod environment. But what I want to talk about um, now um, in more detail is the next configuration. So Configuration with Nextflow is known as um, decoupled, which basically means that the configuration files and the settings themselves are kind of spread out across a number of different places. Um, and then how these work together um, is all based on an order of priority. So there are actually seven different places that you can add configuration options to your pipeline. Um, and in terms of the order of priority, um, parameters specified on the command line using a parameters flag, uh, much like the greeting parameter that we've been using hello.nf, um, is the top of priority. So what that what it, that effectively means is that whenever you use you know dash dash greeting hello world, um, that'll be applied over top of any other in top of um, instead of that parameter being supplied anywhere else. So it's the top of top of priority um, is what will be applied. Underneath that, we've also got um, this parameters file option. So this is an option that you can add um, at the time of execution. You can include a JSON file, um, which has a series of parameters um, included as a part of that as well. Under that, we have the config file, which can be provided using the minus C option at the time of execution as well. Um, this is a configuration file that can have a series of different scopes. Um, the scopes are used to kind of um, collect a bunch of settings under the same kind of banner. Um, that's probably how I describe it. Uh, we will talk about scopes uh, very shortly. Under that, we've got these two config files um, in the current directory. And if it was on GitHub, um, like the pipeline project directory, um, or the, the project directory itself, if even if you've got it locally. Um, the current directory is where you're launching from. So if you've got a nextnode.config file in there, this would be um, applied. Um, and all the settings inside that would be applied. Um, if you have a nextnode.config inside your pipeline project directory, so if you're calling it locally or from GitHub and there's a nextnode.config file there, um, this would also be applied. Underneath that, we've also got um, a hidden nextnode config file in your home directory. Um, so this is a really good place to store some things that might be specific to you as a user. So it could be like your username and email and things like that as an example. Um, and finally, right at the bottom of priority, um, lists, so the thing that will be written over by um, every other configuration um, level is anything that's been hard-coded into main.nf. So this is partly why we have, um, you know, hello world um, in the main.nf or the hello.nf file in that example we've been using. Um, but if we add anything on the command line, so we override this on the command line using the parameter flag, um, it'll take priority over that. Um, so this is effectively what's known as is decoupled. All of these sort of files are decoupled from each other, and they're also sort of supplied. Uh, they can be supplied at the same time, and depending on where these settings are being supplied, 
um, there's an order of priority with those there at the top of priority taking precedence. Digging a bit more into parameters, um, so the parameters are pipeline specific settings. Um, they can be defined in a number of different places. I think actually every level here you could include parameters. Um, of course, on the command line, we can use this dash dash or hyphen hyphen. This is the biggest difference between parameters and options. So parameters are the two, where then options will be a single um, dash. Parameters can also be stored in this parameters as a parameters file. Um, so I said JSON earlier, but it can also be a YAML file. You can supply these in a way that <clears throat> um, you can just include it um, as a file object at time of execution. Um, so just to demonstrate this, um, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to revert my hello.nf right back to um, the original. So this is just the hello.nf that came out of the box in this environment. What I'm going to do is go um, frames.json. It's going to load that in there and save it. Then I'll just go back here and you'll see they have this params file option. This has been supplied on the command line. I'm just going to run this again here. Inside this params JSON, you'll see that we've got this greeting um, parameter, the same parameter that we've been using the last couple of days. And then this has been supplied. I also wanted to show you that if I was to add um, good tag um, on top of this again, it would take precedent over this params.json because it's at the higher order of priority. Um, so these can be stacked and it's only the one that is at the top um, will be sort of um, utilized by NextFlow. Moving on a little bit to configuration files. So configuration files are for more than just parameters. Um, as I said, that there are a number of different places that they can be included. Um, so these nextflow.configs in your current directory or the workflow directory, um, this home this home config file, um, or also it can be added on the command line using this minus C. Um, so if you were to be adding um, a custom config uh, at the time of execution, you just add it like this. So you'd have the minus C with the custom.config or whatever you've called it um, supplied there at the same time. The syntax for the config um, is a little bit different. It could just be a simple text file and you just need to sort of add um, the name of what you are trying to um, configure with the value. This can be quite simple. So if you're just using something like property one equals world, property, um, another property is hello, property one, these can be stacked. Um, the expressions can be stacked on top of each other. You can use um, curly brackets and expression syntax if you need to, to sort of isolate different parts of that as well. Much like rest of NextFlow, you can use comments. Um, I won't dig into that again. Um, but something that hasn't been talked about um, in a lot of detail is scopes. So scopes um, allow you to organize um, different properties in NextFlow. So in this example here with nextflow.conf, we've got alpha and beta. Um, we've got X and Y. The way these are written with the curly brackets and this dot notation, um, they're 100% equivalent. There is absolutely no difference um, between these two. Um, so just to show you an example of this, um, oh, we could just change um, sorry, just getting my stuff together. Um, you could just do this and this um, are completely equivalent. Um, it really just depends on your preference and also if you find it easier to sort of organize all these things together and have them separated across different lines. Um, these are equivalent and it's up to you to decide um, what you want to do. Parameters is a scope as well. So you can have your parameters as a part of a configuration file. Um, so this is an example here, um, it's quite a simple example, um, but what we have here is a simple, uh, make sure we use the snippet, wherever that's gone, 
Um, we've got hello world, but we could also have a um, nextfor.config. So we do still have the nextfor.config in this folder. Um, what I'm going to do is just add in these here. So these parameters I can supply here. So we go next flow run snippet dot nf. <clears throat> and you'll see we've got bonjour le monde, which is different to what we have here, which is hello world as a part of the main script. So this has been picked up as a part of the nextflow.config file um, at the same time, as I've also shown you previously as well. Um, this is cool. Um, so Chris is cool with them on. So again, you can just sort of stack these and choose how you want to apply them. Um, what I'm really trying to demonstrate here is that there are all these different levels, there is different file formats. Um, it's really going to be up to you as a user to work out how you want to put all of these together. Um, however, I would highly encourage you to have your parameters externalized from your main script. Um, try not to define stuff in your main script. It's much easier to have these things defined in a, um, a next sort of config file like this um, or even in a params.json or something like that, just so you're not kind of um, relying on the same settings that you might forget about at some point. Um, I think it's much nicer to have it externalized where you um, have much more visibility. There's also this... Um, environment scope. So the environment scope allows the definition of one or more variable that will be exported into the environment where the workflow task will be executed. Uh, so here, for example, we have um, env alpha and beta, uh, which has been set to some value and home to some path. Um, here, we've just got a script that will execute this. Um, executing the snippets above would produce the following output, um, which is basically just printing these out um, from your environment, just showing that these have been um, made available. The process config is a scope that you should um, be quite aware of. So the process directive allows the specification of settings for task for the task execution, such as CPUs, memory container, um, you know, these directives that we've talked about as a part of the process um, and other resources in the workflow script. So this is really useful in prototyping a small workflow script. However, it's always good practice to decouple um, the workflow execution logic from the process configuration setting, um, as I was kind of alluding to previously as well. It's nice to have this decoupled. Um, the process configuration scope allows the settings for any process directives in the NextFlow configuration file. So what this essentially means is that you could have a NextFlow config um, with the process scope and inside that you can set your directives. Um, in this case we've got CPUs, memory and container and this will be applied to um, everything within that workflow. There's also an example here um, how you can sort of supply um, processes with kind of like dynamic expressions using closures. Um, this is a little bit potentially, um, it's a little bit more advanced, but you've got this process foo here. Um, in the memory, you can sort of scale based on um, how many CPUs were made available to that as well. So you can kind of mix and match and choose how you want all this to fit together. Um, we don't have the time today to dig into um, exactly what this would look like. So, while you would have this as a part of the process, so um, this would be your process um, as a part of um, sort of the, the, the snippet.nf, this should actually be snippet.config um, or nextflow.config um, because here we have uh, the process scope. As you part of the process scope, we have a selector. In this case, it's with name. It could also be with label. Um, these are ways that you can choose particular processes or series of processes that have been tagged with the same label um, to supply resources to. This is quite a common thing that's done as a part of the um, NF core sort of community as well. Um, but by using the process selector, you can selectively apply um, 
sort of configuration options, these directives to your processes without having to hard code them into every process themselves. Um, and this is really a part of the foundation for the NF core shared components um, in that this is all externalized from the processes themselves. So moving on down a little bit um, to configuring Docker execution. So <clears throat> um, of course, with this support for Docker, there's Singularity, there's Conda, um, there's support for each of these individually, or you can sort of have them all set up and then sort of choose which one you want to use at the time of execution as well. Um, but with this as well, again, you can use this process scope um, and then choose the container that you want to use. In this case, this is um, one container for an entire pipeline. Um, however, as we've just sort of talked about up here, you could um, include your containers here as a part of a config file um, using process selectors as well. Um, so this is all pretty much the same um, across the, the configuration of Docker, Singularity, um, and Conda. Um, to actually get these to run, um, you can add these to your nextdo.config um, by using you know, process.container and then the docker scope, docker.enable equals true, um, to supply these to your pipeline um, using configuration in a decoupled way. Without going into um, a lot of examples, you can see that um, you can choose different um, images with specific IDs. Um, you can choose different images um, if it's you know, docker like singularity. Um, as I've just mentioned, you can also sort of supply these to different processes individually. Um, there's a huge amount of flexibility here in terms of what you want to do when configuring um, all of your pipelines. Um, actually doing this requires a lot more time and effort, um, but if this is something you're interested in, um, I would consider jumping back to the dependencies and containers and spending a bit more time looking at some of those exercises there and then thinking about how if you were to externalize this, um, how you could do this using um, these, uh, excuse me, process selectors and then adding them to uh, what should be the nextlo.config, not the snippet.nf file um, here. There's a typo. Okay, so deployment scenarios. This is, um, again, kind of an extension of configuration in a way. So with deployment of Nextflow, you have the option to sort of um, quickly and easily choose where you want to sort of send your execution. So if you've written a pipeline that is containerized, um, it's been written in a really reproducible way, it's all been sort of shared on Git, um, you can basically um, have your Nextflow pipeline, um, you can send it to where it needs to be. So you can send it to, you know, instead of running it locally on your computer, you can send it to your Slurm scheduler and then um, <clears throat> have it all executed from there, or you could sort of send it up to the cloud as well. Um, it's all a little bit decoupled, so this word decoupled comes up again. Um, so like Nextflow doesn't really care where it's being run. Um, you can tell it where you want to run it. And if you've written the pipeline using good reproducible practices, um, it should scale very quickly and easily as well. How quick um, is it to actually swap um, where the executor should be, um, incredibly quick. So inside the nextflow.config file, you can just change, um, loc if you haven't set anything, it'll be local, um, but you could just change this to process.executor equals slurp. And then what will happen is that um, nextflow will try and submit um, your jobs as slurp jobs. So what does this actually look like? Um, this is a little bit harder to um, sort of demonstrate as well. So um, don't be alarmed when this fails. Um, but what I'm going to do is just run this nextflow run um, snippet.nf. I've saved this into my nextflow.config. This is a part of the configuration settings. This will get picked up by nextflow. expecting that to run quite so easily. Um, let's try hello dot if instead. Okay, that's a bit better. It fails. So what's actually happening? I don't think I saved it before, which didn't help my um, didn't help matters. Um, so what's actually happening here is that Nextflow is trying to send SBatch jobs, which is uh, what's used by the Slurm scheduler, 
um, to actually send your jobs um, to your cluster using, using SBatch. If you were to go and dig into um, these processes, you can actually look at the run command. So the command that was uh, executed by Nextflow, command dot run. Um, you'll see here that this code at the, pot, the top is actually the same code that you would use um, to submit your job to Nextflow. And then if we scroll down a little bit, um, we will see the actual um, script .sh. Um, this is the script that it tried to run or tried to launch um, using this nxf um, launch command. So Nextflow is actually managing the execution of your jobs for you. You don't need to write a series of sbatch commands. Um, you can just sort of send this from your head node or whatever node you're working on. And as long as it's got access to um, basically the scheduler, um, Nextflow will be able to sort of manage the execution of these jobs for you. Jumping back to the material here, um, of course, there are a number of different um, cluster resources that you might want to manage. Um, as a part of the process scope, um, you can choose the executor and also choose things like the queue and the amount of memory time and CPUs that you want to um, allocate to your job. And again, Nextflow can manage all of this for you, so you don't need to manually go through um, and think about how you want to edit these sbatch commands. Um, you can supply all of this as a part of a configuration file um, using the process scope and it will um, manage that for you. You can also submit Nextflow as a job itself. So you could write um, a launch, basically, script uh, to submit the job for you. So the entire Nextflow job would be submitted to your cluster, and then the rest of it could be sort of submitted um, you know, locally or from there, um, rather than doing it from your head node and submitting the job sequentially as different dispatch jobs. Um, you have a little bit of flexibility um, as the user for that as well. Um, the code here will help you sort of um, do that as well, where it's got this custom launch NF script. As I've mentioned um, a couple of times recently, and we'll mention again here, because this is a quite a cool feature, um, it's something that I think um, is very valuable. In real-world applications, different tasks need different amounts of computing resources. Um, just like you can supply different containers, different processes, you can also choose to supply different resources. So, you know, by using the process scope uh, with these different process selectors with name uh, for Fur and Bar, these two named processes, you can supply different CPUs, memories, and even send them to different queues. At the same time, you could um, have labels for all of your processes. So, for a directive for each of the different processes, you could say, I want this to be you know, big job, small job, um, high memory, low memory, whatever you want these to be. Um, and then when it comes to writing your configuration file, you have all these labels available, um, which you can supply, um, or you can choose which resource you want to allocate to them as well. And of course, these could be used kind of in combination um, or in parallel with um, things like the with name processor, which might sort of specify the container. So you can sort of think, okay, I want labels to be exclusively for resource management. So I'm gonna have all of my labels set up so that I can apply resource labels. So CPUs, memory queues, things like that. And then all of my process selectors, uh, process with name selectors, I'm just gonna worry about the container images. So you might wanna go in and edit one and not the other, um, but you have them separated out. So you have this, this flexibility and control of how you wanna do this. Something else you can do um, is you can actually establish profiles as a part of these configuration files. So profiles are effectively groups of configuration options that you can supply at the time of execution. So with the minus profile command line option, you could say minus profile standard, in which case these would be the, the configuration options that are supplied. Similarly, you could say minus profile or dash profile or hyphen profile, whatever you want to say. Um, cluster, in which case these would be the cluster settings that you want to supply. You could also use these in combinations and say, you know, uh, minus profile standard comma cluster. Um, you can pick and choose and match and have multiple um, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, the point I really want to make here is that with these sort of profiles is that you can sort of supply them um, 
on a whim at the time of execution um, and you can sort of group together a bunch of different settings that might be applied in specific settings um, you know for specific profiles or profiles of users um, cloud deployment um, is especially hard to demo if not completely impossible to demo from Gitpod. Um, but we have a lot of support for uh, cloud deployments on things like AWS Batch. Um, there's some nice notes here about the different settings that you might want to um, include and how things like volume mounts um, work and the settings that you might want to look at there. <clears throat> um, right down the bottom here, I did want to point out um, one last thing, which is about hybrid deployments. So hybrid deployments um, basically mean that you could um, run your entire pipeline across, um, you know, multiple different um, deployment um, executors. So you could say, I want to start off locally for all of my small jobs while I'm just sort of dealing with the sample sheet. As I am, you know, as the jobs get bigger, I want to send them to Slurm. Um, but for anything with this label, big task, I want to send this to AWS Batch. Um, all of this is possible with Nextflow. You have this really great control of the different processes, labels. Um, you can do all of this um, in a really dynamic way. Um, and because there are all these different configuration options that I've shown you previously, you can have all of this abstracted out across different files. I don't think there is one sort of best practice for how this should be arranged. Um, I would suggest kind of checking out some of the NFCore configs um, about how they've been set up, um, especially if you're um, thinking about how, you know, real world pipelines are structured uh, for things like this as well. Seeing how NFCore has used labels and then also had different kind of configuration files and modules and base and, and things like that. Um, just gives you a really nice idea or a suggestion of how you might want to separate these out yourself as well. Okay, so what we'll do now is move on to cache and resume. I'll try and keep this section, um, or next couple of sections, quite short. Um, again, just because they are quite hard to demonstrate, but also I think a few of these ideas have come up um, multiple times, but also covered in more detail as a part of the um, advanced training. So as you've already seen, we've utilized a few times, Nextflow has this caching mechanism that works by assigning um, unique IDs. Um, so these sort of workflow directories, um, the names of these workflow directories, um, to each execution directory um, where the tasks are executed and the results are stored. Um, these are effectively 128 bit hash values comprising the task input values, files, and command string. Um, so here, for example, we've got this, this work directory with, um, excuse me, 12, um, followed by the rest of the hash there. Um, the structure like this is really just used to help separate out the files um, without creating any clashes. So how does the resume functionality really work? So by adding the resume command line option, um, it allows the workflow to resume the execution from a step that was last completed successfully. Um, in practical terms, the workflow will still execute um, in big sort of air quotes there uh, from the beginning. But before a process is executed, it will check the task ID. And if Nextflow thinks that um, the task is about to execute is the same as the task ID that already exists, um, then that step will be skipped and the results will be pulled from the cache or from that work directory, uh, meaning that it isn't executed again. All of the work directory um, files are um, basically stored unless you clear them. This is quite an important point um, because if you don't clear this often, this file can get quite large quite quickly. Um, so at some point you do need to go in there and clear it out, which will, of course, inactivate the cache. The work directory itself um, is created in this folder called work um, in the launching path by default. Um, but especially on a large system, it's recommended that you can make this scratch. Um, and you can choose um, to do this by using this minus W um, at the time you execute your script. Um, or you can also in queue include this as a part of um, your configuration settings 
Um, again, this might be an example of where you could store this in your um, home nextflow.config or next, your home nextflow config file. Um, again, this is kind of just like re-stressing um, a point that's already been made, is that the hash code um, for the input files, for the, the work directory, um, is computed using the complete file parts, the file size, and the last modified timestamp. This is quite important as well, because it means by just touching the file or opening a file, it can invalidate um, that section or that task execution because the timestamp has changed. So you need to be really careful about how um, you test or if you are troubleshooting and trying to go back through and work out what's happened um, by touching a file um, all the way at the top of the, the workflow, the top of the pipeline, by changing the file or inactivate the cache for everything else beneath that, anywhere that file is kind of filtered down or be used somewhere else, that's all inactivated and you'll have to start again. Some advice for organizing your experiments. Um, generally, I would advise to um, organize these as separate folders. So when you are executing your pipelines, NextFlow is creating logs. Um, those logs are kept in hidden files that you might have missed um, already. Um, so you can already tell that um, this is a bit of a, a mess of a directory. Um, but if you actually look at the hidden files by using um, LL, um, you'll see that there's a huge number of hidden um, .nextflow.logs. We've also got this Nextflow folder in here where a bunch of other assets and things are being stored as well. But um, if you go and look into all of this, this is all information that Nextflow is storing, um, keeping um, from my executions um, so that I can go back and interrogate these again. You can actually use this nextflow.log command. Um, we haven't talked about this a lot so far, um, if at all. So nextflow log allows you to um, view your previous executions in this working directory. So you can see here, these are all the different scripts that I've run today. Um, we've got some basic details about them. Um, so when I launch them, the duration, the run name, the status, the revision, and the session ID, um, as well as the command that was actually executed. Um, all of that has been kept um, in this directory. If we were to move into a different directory and try that again, um, you'll see that Nexo log um, is empty because nothing was executed there. But if I'd been smart and been separating out each of these different um, sort of exercises um, throughout, I wouldn't have one big series of logs to look through. I would only have um, the log specific to a specific, you know, specific project um, in this folder. So for that reason, um, what I would do is um, my experiment, um, CD my experiment, and then just launch everything from um, from here, <clears throat> so that um, all of your experimental sort of runs and all that data is stored locally. Um, if you were to do this as well, you can have your work directory stored in here. However, I would also um, probably preferentially advise you to use um, Scratch instead. So um, just taking a step back again, Ooh, see. Um, I'm just going to do a run very quickly, assuming I haven't broken this. Okay, I've not broken this. Um, I'm just going to do run script. Uh, I'll just do two dot NF. Ah, it's because I've added that to my, this is another good reason um, to be careful about where you store your configuration options, because if you're like me, you can forget about uh, the things you've added on the web. Uh, so I'm just going to try that again. Okay, so what I was building up to here is wanting to actually take this uh, run name and then just go next flow log. And as you can see here, you can supply the run name. 
and actually view specific details for that specific run. In this case, all the different work directories. So I could go through and work out what these work directories were um, and go and have a look inside them as well because there's going to be links to look inside. As an extension of this, there are actually a lot of different fields um, that are being collected. Um, so instead of um, this, I'm just going to add minus L. And these are all different fields that you might be interested in and actually um, sort of looking at or characterizing. Taking this um, again, so instead of using minus L to list all of these options, I'm going to use minus F just to select the fields I want. Um, you can see here that I can sort of pull out the process, um, the exit, the hash, and the duration of how long these took to run as well. Um, again, if you're trying to interrogate your run and work out why things might have failed, um, go back and resume a run. Um, these are the types of things that you might be interested in um, going to have a look at. At the same time, one of the things you can do, um, and I think this is quite cool as well, is that you can um, basically save a template. Um, so if there are specific sort of providence features that you are interested in and want to sort of reflect on um, quite often, what you can do is um, sort of save this as template.html. Just going to save that in there. Um, so all I've done here is just copied this code out here, saved it as template um, HTML. And now what I'm going to do um, is just run this again, but instead of minus F, I'm going to go minus 10. And what this will do um, is actually create quite a nice um, providence report wherever it's gone. Um, this is a provenance report that's taken um, the fields that were a part of that template, um, and this is quite a nice, um, is that going to show for me? Okay, it hasn't rendered very well um, here, but you can see that this has actually created a nice report for me, um, or as a start of a nice report um, that could be used and shared with collaborators or friends, um, <clears throat> just showing um, sort of the outcomes of your reporting as well for out of your runs. Okay, um, so moving on a little bit again, so troubleshooting resume, um, sort of going back to resume functionality again. There are three quite nice um, sort of articles being produced by Secure and Nextflow about um, this functionality and some of the different tips and tricks um, you might need to use to work out what's going on. Um, if you are having trouble with resume and you're trying to work out what's going on, um, I highly recommend um, these here as a good resource. Here are some of the more common sort of reasons um, that can cause your, your resume functionality to be inactivated. Um, so input file name change. So you need to make sure that there's no change in your input files. Um, there's just to be reminded that don't forget your task unique cache is computed by taking into account the complete file path. So if you've moved the files around um, or touched the files, modified the time step in any way, it will be inactivated. Um, a process modified the input. So by accident, you might have modified an input um, based on how you have used your variables. Um, if you're using good practices, this shouldn't be such an issue, but if you've accidentally written over something that you've modified a file, which is a requirement of some um, processing steps, this would um, inactivate your cache as well. Um, some file attributes on some shared file systems, such as NFS, um, may report an inconsistent file timestamp. Um, to help prevent this, you can use a lenient caching strategy. So you can change the way the caching works and make it more lenient. Um, generally, I would say don't make it more lenient unless you have to. Um, lean into Nextflow's stringency. Um, you know, trust what you're doing. Trust that you haven't accidentally resumed something and then you're getting weird results because you didn't realize. Um, trust that Nextflow is um, taking care of, of, you know, the file attributes for you. Um, race conditions for global variables. So you might have um, some channels that are effectively causing race conditions. 
Um, so so that might be you know access to a shared resource or if you're using some type of counting mechanism, doesn't really matter what it is. Um, but it basically could happen when um, using global variables with two or more operators. Um, and that variable is defined in the global scope when it could be sort of used multiple places. Um, this is explained in really good detail um, as a part of the advanced training as well, if you're interested in that. <clears throat> um, finally, non-deterministic input channels. So uh, while data flow channel ordering is guaranteed, data is read in the same order in which it's written in the channel. Um, so there's no guarantee that elements will maintain the order in the process output channels. Um, so if you're kind of just stacking these things on top of each other and expecting it to be in the same order, um, it might not be, especially if files are different sizes. Um, so you need to be really careful about how you're sort of um, splitting and rejoining um, your files together. Um, this can definitely be helped with things like a matching key or a, a thorough matching key. Okay. Um, finally, um, last but several, second to last and certainly not least, um, is error handling and troubleshooting. So there are lots of suggestions here for different ways that you can interrogate um, sort of your runs. Of course, um, there is the error execution debugging. So, um, you know, depending on how your process or task was executed, um, you'll get some sort of um, sort of error. Um, with some luck, you'll be able to go back through and work out what this means. So <clears throat> one thing that um, has kind of been shown um, a little bit here and there, um, but I will go back now and just show you in detail, is that there are actually a lot of um, sort of dot files that have been created um, with every execution. Um, all of these are inside the work directory, inside the task directory where the process is being executed. So here, for example, I'm just going to take this first process. Um, let's go uh, long list. We're going to go to work. There are all of these files here. So command.begin, command.error, command.log, command.out, command.run, and command.sh. Um, the command.run is a nice one because this is um, a huge amount of information about the run of the command. Um, this is what NextFlow is actually trying to execute. Um, with experience, you can get an idea of um, what's happened here. Um, however, this isn't probably your first point of call for that. I think you probably want to look at the, the log for sh. This is where, excuse me, the command or sh. Um, this is where you can look at the command that was actually executed by Nextflow, executed as a part of that um, run command. Um, if you see that variables haven't been replaced here properly, um, that is a sign that something hasn't worked potentially with your variables. Um, as your inputs and outputs. Um, so this can be a really nice file to go in and dig into. The log, um, if something has gone wrong, you might have some nice outputs into the log, um, which could give you some nice clues. Um, begin, again, um, you don't really expect to see much if everything has gone right, but if something's gone wrong, um, it can be quite um, enlightening to see what's happened in there. Same with error. Um, you'll see that when things have gone well, um, this doesn't um, necessarily um, give you anything extra. Ooh. Jumping back over to um, the training material, um, this is kind of the, the descriptions, or probably better descriptions, but I've given you um, already. Um, but you'll see that all of this is kind of listed here. Um, as well as as a reminder here that the input files are sim linked in. Um, however, you can change this to copying if you want, but it's just going to be copying files when you don't need to. Um, as well as any files that are created, we created here as outputs. Um, just to show you what that looks like as well. Um, again, just using this hello.nf as an example because that's a, a file we're quite familiar with, or a pipeline we're quite familiar with. Um, you'll see here that we don't actually have any output files, but we can see that this input file has been sim linked in. If we were to be using one of the scripts, so scripts one through seven, um, you would see that this would be um, 
produced here as well. There would be a file that was produced. Um, just because I do think this is an important point. Let me explode run script seven with with Docker. <clears throat> Um, so what I want to show you here is just that there are the files that have been produced um, sitting locally in this folder as well. It's nice and quick. I thought it was going to be looking into... Um, you can see here that this is the folder and report that were created by MultiQC, um, whether we had these other logs um, that were actually supplied to it. These were some linked in. Um, here we have the files that were created. Um, as outputs. And it looks like there was a log generated by multi QC as well. So, what we can do is actually jump in there and look at that as well. Again, these are all just files that you can interrogate and try and understand if something has gone wrong. Um, you can also add in directives to choose how you want to deal with um, error strategy. So, here is an example of just using ignore. So, if it's just an error, you can say ignore it. Just keep moving the pipeline forward. Um, you can also do things um, such as retry. So if it has failed, you can try again. You can also use um, some sort of like custom logic to choose about, you know, how you want to scale this. Like, you know, if you're going to try it again, do you want to try it with more resources, less resources? How many max retries uh, should we try before we just sort of fail out? Um, you can add all of this in as directives. Something that is quite common is using um, resource, uh, excuse me, dynamic resource allocation. Um, so, you know, if you are going to be retrying it, so the task attempt increases, um, you could try again with more. Um, again, these are kind of features that <clears throat> um, you can think about um, and apply as you um, sort of scale your pipelines. Um, you probably won't sort of launch in and do all of this stuff straight away, but I think it's nice to know about it so that when you sort of think, okay, now I want to move this to the next step, I want to send this to the cloud, I want to do more, I want to deal with these pesky failures, um, at least now you'll be aware of it. So you know how to sort of come back and think about this um, and know what some of the options available to you are. Okay, um, so that's the last part of kind of this um, block of training. However, we do have one section left. Um, which is the Kira platform. Um, so I am just going to jump over here um, and I will clean up um, this just a little bit. Um, and then we're going to start talking about Secure platform and how you can access it uh, for free. So uh, finally, to close things out, what I'll do is give you a bit of an introduction to Secure platform. Um, what I will try and point out is everything that you can do for free as a part of a platform. Um, you pretty much have full accessibility. There's just some limitations on how many sort of um, records you can keep and how widely you can share um, your runs. But um, largely, this is a fully functioning platform that you have access to for free. So Secure Platform, um, previously known as Nexo Tower, is a centralized command post for data management and workflows. Um, it really helps bring together monitoring, logging, and observability to distributed workflows and simplifies the development, uh, excuse me, the deployment of workflows um, on cloud, um, cluster, or your laptop. Some of the core features include um, launching of a pre-configured pipelines with ease, programmatic integration uh, that meets the needs of organizations, so being able to share this with others, um, publishing pipelines to shared workspaces so others can see um, your pipelines developed and also deploy them themselves, um, and management of the infrastructure required to run your data analysis at scale. So um, having managed those um, cloud uh, computing environments. What was we'll started by doing though um, is kind of like exploring the platform through the online GUI. Um, to do that, we just have to set up um, a couple of things first. So the first is this token. Um, so what we all need to do is sort of just jump on over here to secure.io. Um, hit this login button at the top of the page. Once you've done this, um, you'll need to sign in with your GitHub. Um, if you haven't registered with this before, um, it will take you just a couple of clicks to register, um, but um, it isn't um, a big, long, difficult reg registration process. 
once you have accessed this, um, you'll land somewhere that looks a little bit like this. Um, you might be landing on the community showcase, which is a nice showcase room um, full of some of the NFCore pipelines that you can launch um, and run and monitor um, just using an AWS environment we have available here just for you to explore uh, how this would look, look with preloaded um, pipelines as well. Jumping back to the training material, um, you'll see here that we have a list of instructions for how you um, need to first generate a token. Um, and then also um, your workspace. So just to do this um, live in front of you, but I do encourage you to, um, if you can't keep up or if you um, want to stop and look at any of the stuff again, um, you can follow through these instructions here on the website as well. But what I'm going to do is go over here to the top right hand corner of my profile, uh, next to my profile avatar rather. Down here we have your tokens. I'm going to click on that. If I was to add a new token, um, I would add in a short name here, um, click add, and it would generate this access token for me. I am not going to do that today. Um, I've already pre-made a community demo token here, uh, which I'll be using. However, if you are following this through yourself, um, you can see that you can just add the token name here. And then after you've hit add, it'll give you um, your personal access token, which you need to copy and keep for now. What you need to do with it is actually export it um, using um, this line of code here. So you would add an export tower access token and then whatever this um, token was here, you would copy this um, and put this in um, on the rest of this line here. Then you just hit enter um, and it'll export it um, to your environment. After that, you also need to export um, a tower workspace ID. To set up a workspace ID, um, I'm just going to click here on the secure to go back and then go to this drop down menu. You can, first of all, you will need to, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, first of all, you need to add an organization. Um, so you can just call this, um, you know, my org Chris. Maybe let's call it Chris's. Chris org, Chris org, description, and org for Chris. Uh, I can give the location, the ID. Oop. You know, I can give it a website and a logo if I wanted to as well, but I'm just going to add that. You can see here that I now have Chris org listed under my organizations. I can click on that, and now I need to add a workspace. So this could be uh, my project, my project. Um, you can see here that I'm not giving a lot of thought to these names, but um, you could of course give different projects, different names, different descriptions, um, depending on what you're trying to do. And I'm just gonna make this nice and public so that if I did um, add anyone else into this, uh, they'd be able to see it as well. Or anyone else in my organization will be able to see this as well. What I'm really interested in here, though, is this ID. So going back to the um, training material, we have this export workspace ID. I'm just going to copy that, move that over here, and then I am going to um, paste, um, excuse me, this workspace um, ID, um, just in here, like just like this. Great, so now I'm all set up. Um, that's all I needed to do for now. As you'll see at the moment, there's actually nothing happening inside my um, organization or my project. We have an empty launch pad. Uh, we don't have any runs to look at. Um, there's nothing here under actions, data sets, data explorer, compute environments. Um, it's really an empty space. Um, apart from in this case participants, which is just me. Um, however, I could add some friends in here if I wanted to as well. Going back to the section, which is um, using the online GUI, but also launching um, from the CLI. What you can do is we can add this with tower flag um, to our runs. And what this will do is we'll send our runs to secure a platform to monitor. 
So what this looks like is nextflow run script 7.nf with tower. And I'm also going to add in um, with Docker here because I've um, been playing around with uh, my configuration file. <clears throat> What this is doing is sending all of my logs, the monitoring for this pipeline to my project inside my organization. So here under runs, I can see this, this whole run running. I can see what I've just launched running here. You can see here the command line. So the command line that was um, actually shown back over in my Gitpod environment. I can see the parameters that were applied. I can see the different configuration options that were applied, even these configurations that were left over from um, earlier in the session. If I'd used data sets, they would have been in here as well. And if I was generating reports, they would have been here. Down here, we can kind of see this general overview of the run. If this was still running, you'd see the different tasks submitted and succeeded. Um, if anything had failed, we would have seen it there. We can see all the processes ticking over here some aggregated stats about how long it took, um, how much memory was used, how much CPU time was used, the wall time, all of these metrics that you'd be interested in um, when running large production um, pipelines. Down the bottom here, we have some of the CPU usage, which allows you to estimate um, kind of the resources that were allocated. I'll come back to that. Um, but you can see here that I can actually monitor the run. Um, what I'm going to do is actually show you what this looks like with a um, NF core pipeline. Um, so I'm just going to quickly use um, RNAC pipeline. Docker. Um, this will launch the test profile for the NF4 pipeline. So it's a minimal test data set used to test the pipeline um, using continuous integration and other things like that. Um, oh, I'm just going to kill that for a second because I forgot to add with power. So now, as this is launching, um, what I'll hopefully see very soon after it's finished pulling, um, is that I'll be able to sort of track and monitor this pipeline in secure platform as well. Pretty close to being fully launched. Ah, there we go. So you can see how it's been updated. And we can see that this is the run, all of the real life parameters that have been included, configuration options, um, all of this is listed here. You can see that we've got a job running, two succeeded, all of the different jobs are listed down here as well. <clears throat> you can see that in a, in a real life sort of pipeline, when you actually want to go in and look at some of this information, so these are some of the execution logs, um, different things that uh, might be interest of you to interest, that might be of interest to you, um, as a user, um, as a developer, um, you can start to explore this here um, using the platform. Um, so just while that's running, um, I'm going to jump back over to um, this community workspace. Um, so this is just the showcase area that has um, a bunch of different pipelines that um, are already a part of NF Core. Um, so for example, this is the NF Core RNA Seq pipeline. Um, so what you can do is set up um, your org. Um, you could add in, um, you know, your um, launch pad here, where you could add in your pipelines um, directly from GitHub. Um, you can start adding in different parameters and resource labels, different advanced options. Uh, you can specify all of this here so that much like over in the community showcase, we just have um, a list full of different pipelines that you want to launch. Um, you can just go in here, browse these, find out what they do, find out um, the different compute environments that are available to it. Um, and then once you are happy, you can just say launch. And what this will do is just come up with this nice um, interface that allows you to 
uh, basically fill out everything that you need um, to launch this pipeline um, in your environment. Uh, what you'll see is that there's also some um, options for, um, so there's all the parameters, uh, all the different hidden parameters as well. Uh, we haven't really talked about any of your pipelines, a lot of detail, um, but as you can imagine for like real life production pipelines, these are quite big with a lot of different settings that you might want to choose. Um, there's also the options here to upload these parameters files, which we talked about briefly uh, very recently, but you can just launch that. Um, provided that I shouldn't have added in anything else there, but <clears throat> you can see here that all of this is um, executable and can be launched and monitored um, from here as well. So as this has been submitted, it's gone away to try and spin up some um, instances on AWS, so this will take a wee while to launch, uh, but that will sort of run quietly in the background. While that is doing that, though, I just want to point out a few different features. So you can have actions. Um, so there's automated workflow executions um, that can be triggered uh, based on you know different webhooks, for example. Um, you can establish your own data sets. So you can have um, upload data sets in here, and this could be sort of data that you've got um, stored somewhere. So this could be like an S3 bucket. Um, you can upload your data sets through here, and this will be able to go away, um, go and pull in sort of versioned um, TSB, CSB files if that's how you want to. Um, store things like patient metadata. We've also got Data Explorer. So if you are storing your data um, on like different buckets, for example, um, you can go away and explore that as well as sort of explore these publicly available buckets at the same time. Um, the idea here is that you can actually sort of go in there and touch this data um, rather than just sort of referring it to it by a, by a file path. You can establish your own compute environment. So if you do um, use AWS, for example, you can sort of have these compute environments um, that are available and sort of pre-establish a specific projects, um, which can be really helpful, especially in combinations with things like um, labels. Um, so what I didn't show you back here is that you can actually add um, different labels to your runs um, so that you know, like, you know, where the costs are attributed back to and things like that, um, which can be really helpful. Uh, credentials, you have lots of options in here for credentials, so you can store different credentials for different um, you know, different agents or different, um, you know, GitHub accounts or whatever else you want to store in here. Um, very similarly, you can have um, different secrets in here as well, so you don't expose anything um, by accident. Finally, you can sort of add in your team so that um, you don't have to do science alone. You can share this with colleagues um, so they can track and monitor your runs as well um, at the same time. Um, depending on your administration level, you can control who has access to do what. Um, so while you might want to share it with one or you want to give more privileges to someone else, um, you can do all of that through participants in different roles at the same time. Um, so it's jumping back here to the to the run. Um, this is still running. It's probably still just spinning up. Um, it's taking a wee bit of time. Um, but you can see here that the war time started ticking over. Um, we're all getting estimated cost um, based on all of this as well. Something I wanted to show you as well, um, quite a cool feature, is that you can actually optimize um, some of these runs as well. So um, based on previous runs, you can um, optimize the execution of a pipeline. So based on previous runs, you can sort of basically learn, <clears throat> you know, learn um, the platform will help um, realize what you actually utilized of your requested resources and then come up with this um, configuration file which is using the process scope with a series of different uh, with name selectors uh, for every different process as a part of that. This is all based off um, if you were to go back in here and actually look at one of these pipelines um, you'll see down the bottom here that there's a lot of resources that were requested and it was actually utilized um, so you know when you've requested a lot more then you've actually used um, and the usage is very, very minimal. You can actually go away and optimize based on this so that when you are requesting resources, it's much more intelligent um, than just kind of guessing about what you actually need. Um, at the same time, for different um, sort of runs, you can sort of have this reporting, um, which has been generated, and you can sort of go in here and start accessing all of this as well um, through the platform. So this is kind of a scatter shot, um, all the different functionality uh, that is available as a part of a platform. 
Um, jumping back here to the actual trading material, um, all of this is a kind of explained um, in slightly more detail, but um, you can see here that you've got options to configure your compute environment. Um, there are lots of different cloud providers as well as um, schedulers um, available. And what you can do with the platform is you can basically hook it in so that um, as you're launching these runs, you can sort of do this on your cluster or the cloud um, and then keep an eye on it through the platform. Um, you've also got options here to set um, a default compute environment. Um, so you can use decide what to make um, default, excuse me, um, uh, you can choose what to make default um, every time you launch, which is really helpful so that you um, can kind of pick something a little bit conservative um, rather than going something that might cost you a lot of money, especially if you're going through the cloud. Um, it's a little bit more about Launchpad there, how you can click on these pipelines and launch them. Um, there's also this pipeline parameters form, uh, which I showed very shortly as well. So with each of these files, you can have um, effectively a schema file, which you can use to get rendered. Um, and this helps you input all of this um, in the platform, which means that it's a lot easier for those that aren't biopeticians to access this. Um, or if you're running a lot of pipelines regularly, um, it's going to be a lot nicer to um, input everything you need to rather than having to do it on the command line. There's a big long um, sort of description here about how you can add a new pipeline. Um, I won't go into this here, um, but this is just an example code um, that you might want to consider. Um, and things, uh, some steps that you need to go through to add on that pipeline as well. Um, finally, there's a little bit of a section here about API. So um, you can also use an API to start triggering some of the stuff um, based on different events. Um, so you can also choose to, you know, supply different resources, different users and things like that as well. Um, this is all a part of the workspace organization. Um, one of the final points I sort of touched on there as well. Um, however, ultimately, much like I've been saying um, with other other parts of this workshop material. Um, I really encourage you to come in here and have a play around. Um, it's not going to cost you anything. You can't um, do anything that's going to break um, break the platform. Um, but the showcase is really nice to come in and see what it would be like to launch, you know, have all of your pipelines in here and set up and then just sort of jump in and, and launch um, a pipeline using compute environments um, sort of out of the box. Um, being able to track your runs is really nice. Um, so even going back to uh, my project, the one that I've just created um, here, um, you can see that while this is still running, um, I can see like what's been running, what's been requested, what's been utilized, um, how much memory, all of these things that um, we could access a little bit through the logs, um, but it's really just made so much easier through the platform. Um, you can jump in here and just view all of this stuff. Um, and again, this is really useful for debugging and understanding your code as well. Um, of course, in this environment, nothing's been set up. Um, this is all kind of like an empty slate, but um, in a, um, you know, if you do go in and set all this stuff up, um, it can be really lucrative really quickly um, for you as the user. Of course, uh, I'm sure the secure team um, would be interested in hearing you if you want to know more about this as well. Um, but um, I think the first step is jumping in and trying this out for yourself. Um, seeing what you think um, and seeing if it improves your experience sort of launching, monitoring and running pipelines. Okay, so that is where I'm going to leave it for the training. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending. I know that this session in particular um, is quite long. There's a lot of talking, there's a lot of listening. Um, there isn't a lot of opportunity for sort of engagement or exercises. But what I do want to stress is that um, whether you realize it or not, you've been exposed to a lot of new ideas, a lot of, um, you know, it's the concepts that you learned as part of session one have been expanded. Uh, you've learned more about different sort of, you know, operators and, and different features of the channels um, as two kind of very um, sort of low-hanging examples. But there is there has been a lot covered. Um, it's okay not to understand everything all at once. Um, go back and try and break things. Um, pull out the examples, try it on your own compute, um, you know, try to take what has been shown here and apply it to your own work. Um, I hope that it has been helpful um, from Marcel and I. Um, thank you again for attending. Please don't be a stranger in the community. Um, if you need 
anything. Uh, we, of course, have the NF Core Slack. There is the Nextflow Slack, and there is also the Secure Community. Um, please check those out. They're great resources. Um, yeah, thanks so much.